so this paper is a joint work with uh, Jigo Oha and with uh, Jia Gong Song, who is also here uh, as a panelist today. And what we are trying to understand in this paper is something that Ricardo already alluded to earlier in his uh, introduction, that there was something really unusual going on in the treasury market in March 2020. Right, so the usual playbook that we saw in various crises in the past decades was if some, some trouble hits global markets, then treasury yields fall. And everybody runs into treasuries, buys treasuries, pushes up the price and down the yields. And in March 2020, this is what happened initially. So the red line here is the 10 year treasury yield. Uh, the blue line is the three month yield. And you see that long term treasury yields initially fell, but uh, you know, closer to middle of March, something changed and treasury yields actually started rising, which is a very unusual uh, and puzzling uh, pattern. And, you know, um, what we're trying to figure out is, you know, why, why, why was it different this time? Why, why did treasuries behave so differently from previous crises? Um, one possibility is that, in a way, what we saw there, these, these movements in treasury yields could be some, something like a canary in a coal mine, that something fundamentally changed about treasuries, that they are no longer a negative beta asset or a flight to safety target asset, uh, but investors view them fundamentally differently now. The other, and you know, this is not uh, uh, necessarily a different explanation, but something that could also be playing in is that there was market dysfunctionality going on. Um, there was something in the operations of the market that exacerbated the effects of supply and, uh, supply and demand shock uh, in the market. Yeah? And, and our, our uh, analysis is really focusing on this second possibility. Uh, and we'll have something to say about this that this played some role. But of course, this does not rule out uh, that something fundamentally also changed about treasuries. But uh, as I will show you today, at least, there's not much in the data that we can see it that would support uh, this, you know, kind of fundamental change explanation, but the way we see it is that the jury on this is still, still out uh, at this point. So here's a roadmap of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start with some motivating evidence um, on uh, some supply and demand factors and some, some, some uh, rate movements. And then I'm going to discuss a, um, a model of uh, the treasure yield curve that's based on a preferred habitat model where we're going to introduce a, an intermediation friction in the repo market. And this model is gonna give us some, some additional predictions about what sort of rate movements and spread movements we should see in 2020 if these intermediation frictions are relevant. And I'm gonna show you data on this. And then if there's time at the end, I can say a few words about uh, what our model would say about the 2008 crisis. Um, and it turns out that the same kind of model with a little twist is actually also informative about uh, movements in yields and, and, and rates and so on in 2008. Okay, so if you were worried about a, in a way a fundamental story of why treasury bonds are viewed differently by investors, I guess the first place to look for would be inflation expectations and inflation uncertainty. And there the story is basically that not much happened in March 2020. If anything, inflation expectations fell throughout March 2020. So the red line here is uh, inflation swap rates. The uh, dashed line is break-even inflation rates extracted from uh, tips. And you know, if anything, they fell. So this this doesn't help explain why yields went up uh, in that period between between these two two last uh, vertical lines here. If you look at inflation uncertainty measures from the Minneapolis Fed. Same story, there's no, no evidence that, you know, for example, tail expectations about inflation somehow uh, uh, became more important in, in that period. So th then let's, let's look at supply uh, factors. Uh, you know, one source of supply of additional treasuries in, the, in this March uh, 2020 period was issuance by the US Treasury. And in March, they were actually issuing quite a lot, about $150 billion. Uh, at the same time, we also saw some groups of investors engage in large sales. For example, foreign investors, they sold a total of about $300 billion within one month in March 2020. Domestic investors were also selling, some of them, 
the green bar here is mutual funds. They sold about $240 billion in the first quarter of 2020. Now, who could take up the supply, at least temporarily? Well, the first place to look would be primary dealers. Um, and if you look at their balance sheet, you can actually see that they initially did take up some supply. So here's the balance sheet of, of uh, primary dealers in terms of net treasury holdings on the left left hand side. And you can see that uh, until March 9th, uh, there was an increase of about $50 billion or so in their holdings of coupon treasuries. But then after March 9th, it kind of flattened out. There wasn't much increase anymore. One thing that dealers also do is instead of holding a treasury directly themselves, they can provide repo financing to other investors, hedge funds, for example, to buy these treasuries. And dealers did quite a lot of this. So you can see here is the reverse repo position of the dealer sector. And there was a huge increase of hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, but then sometime in middle, mid of March, this also flattened, flattened out. Okay, so if you do some rough back of the envelope calculation, what we have here is a bunch of sources of additional supply thrown on the market, um, somewhere north of $700 billion. And it was temporarily absorbed by dealers directly, about 50 billion, and by repo financing provided by dealers, 400 a billion. And there's, you know, there's still a gap. We don't quite know where, where the rest of this uh, went. Um, but we do know what eventually happened um, when the crisis was in a way kind of resolved. It was the Fed that stepped in. And late in late March, the Fed started buying treasuries big time. And eventually they ended up with more, uh, uh, you know, an additional one, more than an additional $1 trillion of treasuries uh, on the Fed balance sheet. And at least based on what we see so far, this was basically a permanent change. So they took these treasuries permanently off the market, at least so far. Okay, so we have a situation here where there was basically a significant shift in treasury supply where some investors got out and other investors had to absorb and we did not see a very elastic response by intermediaries and other investors uh, and so we're going to try to explain this 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 you know uh, lack of elastic response with a model in which dealer banks are facing a balance sheet constraint yeah? and uh, we're going to get some predictions out of this for example if you know, there's a supply shock of this kind and dealers have this balance sheet constraint. We should see a steepening yield curve. We should see treasuries trading at an inconvenience yield, which means they should have a higher yield than a, you know, a frictionless uh, interest rate that we can try to measure with derivative contracts. Um, and there should be repo rate spreads. And I'm gonna show you later some data, both on these inconvenience yields and also on these repo rate uh, spreads. Okay, so uh, the model is basically uh, an extension of the preferred habitat model of Greenwood and Vajanus. And in Greenwood and Vajanus, there are two types of investors. There are habitat investors that like to be in a certain you know, place on the yield curve uh, with their holdings. And there are arbitrageurs that are you know, uh, basically providing li liquidity to these uh, habitat investors. What we do in our model is we take these arbitrageurs and we split them into two types of investors. On the one hand, level investors, you can think of them as hedge funds, and there's dealers. And there's a link between the two, which is the repo financing that dealers provide uh, to hedge funds. Okay, so we end up with three groups of investors. Habitat investors that are gonna face an exogenous uh, demand or supply shocks uh, at a certain point on the yield curve. There's gonna be these, these level investors that are gonna hold treasury bonds with repo financing provided by the dealers. And there's gonna be dealers that can either hold treasury bonds directly or provide refin repo financing to these level investors. Okay, and that's gonna be in a way two, two frictions or two, two, two forces that are going to inhibit uh, in a way arbitrage by level investors and by dealers. First of all, dealers and leveled investors are gonna be risk averse. So it's, they're, um, they're gonna demand a premium for, uh, for carrying risk on their balance sheet. And the dealers are gonna face a supplementary leverage ratio, um, which we're gonna implement by having basically a shadow cost of using up uh, balance sheet space. And the important thing will be in the model 
uh, and this is consistent with the regulatory environment, that DDoS are gonna, DDoS, DDoS balance sheet space is gonna be consumed not only by direct holdings of treasuries on the balance sheet, but also by the repo financing that they provide to uh, level investors. So if they, if they lend, uh, uh, if they make a loan against treasury collateral, that's also gonna add to their balance sheet and that's gonna affect uh, their leverage ratio. Okay, so a, a quick sketch of how the model uh, looks like. There is some interest rate risk. This basically comes from a stochastic short rate process. Um, there's gonna be habitat agents that have, as I mentioned earlier already, exogenous holdings uh, subject to some shocks. And the way we have modeled these shocks are as follows. There's basically these beta shocks and they are multiplied by some theta, uh, theta function. And the theta function basically just determines on which part of the yield curve uh, these shocks are going to, to hit. Yeah? And uh, we're gonna have this in, a, in, in the baseline version of the model, very simple. Uh, when we, you know, to analyze the March 2020 period, uh, we're basically going to say the shock hits for long-term treasuries, uh, uh, you know, starting from a certain uh, point on the yield curve for all longer uh, maturity bonds. Okay, um, and then these leveled investors are basically mean variance investors. Uh, and the key thing really just to take away from this here is that they will face a financing cost, this capital R, which is the repo rate that dealers are going to charge them when these leveled investors want repo financing from dealers. So this capital R is gonna be crucial. And this capital R will be determined in equilibrium. And you know, if, if R is higher, this is going to reduce these hedge funds uh, demand for levered positions in treasuries. Dealers are also gonna have the same kind of uh, objective mean variance and they're gonna hold uh, treasuries directly or they can provide repo financing to these leveled investors. Yeah. And the dealers also finance themselves. We assume that they, they can finance themselves at the riskless frictionless rate, small r, and they're going to charge leveled investors this capital R and there could be, could be a spread between the two that's determined in equilibrium. Now, where does the spread come from in equilibrium? It comes from the balance sheet cost. Yeah? So when, when dealers look at, at you know, their objective, there's gonna be a balance sheet cost floating around here that they want compensation for. And so the key thing will be what determines this balance sheet cost? How is this modeled? We're going to specify the balance sheet cost as a function of the aggregated dealer balance sheet uh, in the economy. And it's going to be increasing. Yeah, and you can think of this as, you know, the dealers are basically shifting around holdings uh, uh, among themselves to, to basically optimally, you know, allocate uh, given these costs among themselves. Uh, but the more the aggregate dealer sector is, is forced to absorb on the balance sheet, the higher is going to be the marginal cost of an additional unit of balance sheet. Yeah, and we motivate this with the uh, uh, supplementary leverage ratio uh, plus basically a cost of raising equity uh, you know, so that they cannot just get around, at least in the short run, uh, this leverage ratio constraint by just raising a lot of equity. Okay, and the key thing again is that the balance sheet space will be consumed by direct holdings of the dealers, as well as the repo financing that they provide to, uh, to hedge funds. Yeah? And the balance sheet cost is then gonna be, the marginal cost is gonna be linear in the aggregate size of the dealer balance sheets. Okay, and then how does equilibrium play, play, play out here? We're gonna normalize the aggregate bond supply to zero and then markets have to clear. So the treasury market has to clear, which means habitat investor holdings and repo financed investments by hedge funds and direct dealer holdings all have to add up to zero. And then the repo market has to clear. So whatever hedge funds want in repo is what the dealers provide. Okay, and so, so the key thing really of what's going on here in the model then is that when the hedge fund sector buys bonds from dealers with repo financing, this helps them to share risks with the dealer sector, but it's not gonna relax the dealer's balance sheet constraint because the repo is still going to show up on the dealer's balance sheet. Okay, and then in equilibrium, it has to be the case that the, uh, 
dealer and hedge fund marginal holding costs are equalized, this means the repo spread that dealers charge is equal to the marginal balance sheet cost. Okay, now we can think about what happens when a shock hits the markets. So let's say there's a shock to habitat investors holdings. They don't want treasuries anymore. So it's gonna be, it, it will have to be the case that hedge funds and dealers jointly hold these treasuries. How are they gonna hold them? Well, they're gonna optimally share the risk between themselves and determine you know, who holds how, how much. But whenever the, the hedge funds hold something, they are going to need repo financing for that. And so the balance sheet cost is gonna be affected by the total size of the shock, not just but by the direct holdings of the dealers, but by the entire size of the shock that has to be absorbed either by direct dealer holdings or by repo financed holdings by treasuries, uh, by, by, by hedge funds. Okay. Um, all right. And let's now look at some data on this. Yeah. So what our model now makes two predictions in a way that, you know, something that should be true if this story that we were telling about these intermediation frictions is relevant. Uh, we should see that in a time when dealers are really, you know, dealers balance sheets kind of get, get, uh, get, get tight, then we should see that this repo spread goes up. And, you know, how, how are we going to measure this? So, so we basically want the difference between the rate at which dealers can borrow sort of frictionlessly and the rate that they're going to charge hedge, fund, hedge funds when they lend. Um, we cannot directly observe this, but what we can observe is the rate in the GCF repo market, which is a market where, for the most part, large dealers lend to small dealers. And we can look at the tripod repo rate, which is, for the most part, the rate at which money market funds lend to large dealers. And so we basically get, uh, you know, the rate that dealers pay when, when stuff comes into to large dealers, and we get the rate at which money flows out of the dealers. And we look at the spread between the two. The other prediction is about the treasury inconvenience yield. So when these supply shocks, big supply shocks hit the dealer slash levered investor sector, we should um, see that the treasury start trading at an inconvenience yield. And this basically means that if we were to compare the treasury yield to uh, the, the, the implied yields of a derivative that pays the same cash flows as a physical treasury, but is not subject to these balance sheet costs, then we should say a spread between the two where the treasury yield is higher than the yield implied by this derivative. Yeah? And we do this by looking at overnight index swaps and comparing them with treasury yields. And you know, it's, it's not true that swaps uh, have zero balance sheet costs, in practice, but it's very close to being true. So the, the balance sheet cost is, you know, orders of magnitude smaller than, than, uh, than for, for directly held uh, treasuries or for repo for that matter. Okay, so um, as I said this verbally, let's, let's look at the, uh, the data on this. So the red line here in the left-hand plot is the treasury OIS spread at a 10 year maturity. And you can see Coming into 2020, this was already positive, uh, consistent with there already being some you know, balance sheet costs that dealers basically want to be compensated for. And when we hit this critical period in March 9 in, in, in uh, this year, uh, there these, the spread started dramatically shooting up and it reached levels of about 50 basis points. Uh, and then eventually, you know, once the Fed started intervening and so forth, it basically came back down. Yeah. Um, and this is really something that's happening mostly at the you know, long end of the treasuries. So if you look at the shorter end for, for three month maturities, this is the dashed line at the bottom. You can see this was actually very close to zero. There are also some blips around, but it doesn't have this feature of being you know, such, so, so, so uh, uh, persistently positive as, as at the long end. The right-hand plot is what happens to the repo spread. So uh, you can see that it was a huge spike in, in this critical period in, in uh, the second half of March, 2020, when this repo spread blew out to uh, about 60 to 70 uh, basis points. Um, 
And you know, it's, it's a little bit more spiked than, than what's happening, uh, or a bit more concentrated on a few days than what happens for the treasury OS spread, but it's sort of roughly uh, you know, in, happening in the same, same period. Okay, and then the model also predicts that the yield curve should have steepened. And this is also what we see in the data uh, during, that, during that period. Yeah. Okay, so this is what we have about uh, 2020. The model also has something to say about 2008. Um, and you know, 2008 is in a way interesting in the sense that a lot of things that happened in 2008 were similar to 2020, but with the signs all reverse. Yeah, so for example, if you look at the buying and selling behavior of foreign investors in 2008, they were all buying during these critical months of uh, uh, you know, late 2007, early 2008, there was a big buying pressure from in foreign investors. The Federal Reserve, instead of increasing its treasury holdings, was reducing its treasury holdings throughout the crisis. Yeah. So this looks like there was a large treasury demand shock that the Fed eventually helped to accommodate. Yeah. One way in which the, the Fed helped to accommodate this was by introducing the Term Securities Lending Facility, the TSLF, in March 2008. And with that facility, dealers could basically take non-treasury collateral, give it to the Fed, and get treasuries in return. Yeah. And you can see why the dealers might have wanted that, because they actually entered the crisis with a big net short position in treasuries. Um, and so again, this is again the opposite of what's going on in 2020. In 2020, dealers were long and getting more long. In 2008, uh, dealers were, were short. Our model can help understand what happened in 2008 uh, with one twist, which is the, the friction that is relevant is a different one because the dealers here are not long, they are short. The relevant friction is a short selling cost. Yeah? So if there's one, uh, some cost to, for example, failing to deliver, which would be just doing a naked short sale, or equivalently, we could have a securities borrowing friction that makes short selling costly. Uh, with that introduced in a model, and then you know, given a treasury demand shock, a model basically gives uh, predictions about the convenience yield of treasuries and repo rates that are kind of consistent with what one sees in the data. And so for example, in 2008 then, according to the model, treasury repo rates should be lower than the risk rate. And this is you know, what one tends to see during that, during that period. And the treasury yield should be lower than the OIS swap rates. And uh, that's also what, uh, what we see there and what I'm going to show you. Yeah? So in 2008, then we had a convenience yield, not an inconvenience yield. And the negative holding cost that this implies that treasuries have basically compensates in the model of the dealers uh, for the short selling cost. Yeah? OK, so here's uh, the left hand plot is uh, the treasury uh, OS spread in uh, 2008. And uh, you can see that throughout this period, it was in a negative territory about minus 40 to minus 50 uh, basis points. Yeah? So the signs flipped relative to what, what we had in, in uh, 2020. And eventually it went back to zero after the Fed had a bunch of programs that increased the supply of treasuries uh, in the market. Yeah? So the Fed was facing a very different problem uh, back then from the one it's facing now. The final part of the paper is where we just look at a full period from 2008 to now, and we look at the evolution of these rate spread, the repo spread, and the treasury OIS spread over that period. Uh, so let me start with the right-hand plot, the uh, treasury OIS spread. So we, you know, it started up being very negative in the, at the start of the crisis before the uh, TSLF program of the Fed was introduced. Uh, it shrank a lot when the Fed introduced the TSLF, it moved positive after the financial crisis and it became bigger after the SLR you know, regulation was introduced. Yeah? So, so it, this is an indication that the relevant friction here shifted from that short sale friction uh, slowly over towards uh, the balance sheet constraint being the relevant friction. Yeah? And we see something similar for the repo spread, uh, but for the repo spread, we don't have good data for uh, uh, at, the, at the same kind of frequency for the uh, financial crisis period. So that's why we only have the two last periods uh, there. 
Okay, so uh, let me conclude. So what I've sh shown you is some evidence that the intermediary sector in March 2020 struggled to absorb this negative demand shock that some large owners of treasury uh, apparently had. And a model with Beeler balance sheet constraint goes some way in, in, in explaining a bunch of things in the data that were happening at the same time, like the steepening of the yield curve, the emergence and rise of inconvenience yield of treasuries, uh, the tripod, the uh, GCF tripod, the repo spread, and then also an explanation why, you know, purchases of treasuries and also the exemption of treasuries from the L SLR that the Fed uh, introduced in March, uh, in, in, in April of this year, why this helped basically to uh, reverse these kinds of events. Yeah. What is still open is a very important question, which we don't know the answer to, is, you know, what motivated some large holders of U.S. treasuries to sell, um, and and you know this in, in in our view is a big question going forward, and uh, uh, you know um, um, this 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 relates to some of the thoughts that Ricardo uh, uh, put out in his in his in his introduction at the very very beginning of the of the session uh, today. Uh, okay, great. Thanks a lot, Stefan. Uh, Nina, uh, uh, would you like to start share your slides and start the discussion? Yep. Uh, so, so hopefully you guys can see my slides now uh, and can hear me well. Um, so thanks for inviting me to discuss this paper. Um, it was very interesting for uh, me to read both because uh, these sorts of questions are questions that we have been working on for a few years now. So the impact of post-crisis regulation on liquidity provision in general, but also uh, bank liquidity provision in particular. Um, but also, of course, because um, being at a central bank during this time, uh, you know, we think about these, uh, these questions in this particular setting a lot. Uh, before I start with the actual content of my discussion, let me say the usual disclaimer that these are my views and not the views of the bank or of the reserve system. So, okay, so um, just to give you an overview of the types of things um, uh, that the paper covers, but also what I'm going to be talking about, the basic idea is that uh, post-crisis regulatory changes increase recognition of repo and reverse repo positions for uh, regulatory leverage for bank holding companies in the US. Now that has a number of implications uh, such as changing the willingness of bank holding companies to take on leverage and to provide leverage to clients. Um, it also implies that repo funded positions uh, become more balance sheet expensive. Uh, uh, so potentially implying that bank holding companies are going to require more compensation for absorbing flows uh, in securities that are repo funded. And one thing that I want to uh, point out uh, before, uh, right at the beginning is that here it really is about the, uh, whether a position can be repo funded or not. Um, and so to some extent, this overall story is not just potentially about treasuries, but about other assets such as corporate bonds that when held on bank balance sheets or when held on hedge fund balance sheets tend to be uh, repo financed. So um, Stefan showed us a, a number of dislocation metrics uh, for the dislocations in March and treasuries. I'm going to show uh, a different uh, metric, which is the futures implied repo rate for uh, the cheapest to deliver treasury into the futures contract. The basic idea is that um, usually that spread should be pretty close, uh, that implied repo rate should be pretty close to um, the actual uh, repo rate on, treas on uh, treasuries. But during March, we see uh, that rate become very volatile. And in particular, it first becomes volatile uh, for the 10 year bond, uh, for the 10 year futures contract, excuse me, which is uh, this greenish line. Uh, then it becomes volatile for the five year and finally for the two year. So if you think about this uh, maturity cross section, essentially you see a bigger dislocation uh, early on in longer maturities. 
which then if we uh, split what actually happens to primary Dior balance sheets, um, again, by type of instrument and by maturity of the instrument, we see that the, the absorption that uh, Stefan was talking about primarily happens in terms of coupons uh, with maturities bigger than six years. So um, to explain what I'm actually plotting here, so if we start with the sign position plot uh, on the top left, uh, the values above zero are the long maturities, the, value below, the values below zero are the corresponding short maturities. Um, and in this plot, it's a little bit hard to say whether it's the longer maturities that move the more or the shorter maturities, which is why I'm also giving you, sorry, or the short positions and the longer maturities, which is why I'm giving you the net position plot below. And here again, you can see very clearly that uh, during this March period, what was happening is that uh, dealers had to absorb uh, a lot of supply of coupons above six year that was somewhat upset by them being able to shed some, uh, uh, some treasury bills. Um, and once uh, the Fed interventions happened, uh, that dynamic sort of reversed. So you saw an increase in the bill holdings by um, a primary dealers and a corresponding decrease of longer maturity holdings. Now, the other, uh, the other piece of this uh, puzzle that is, again, important in uh, the supplementary leverage story is what happens in terms of repo financing. So again, um, on the top right, I'm plotting the uh, repo, uh, repo and reverse repo position. So securities lent means a, a repo position, security borrowed uh, means a reverse repo position. And you can see that there is also a dichotomy in terms of the maturity of the repo contracts where we do see an increase in the overnight uh, repo positions, but we also see a corresponding uh, decrease in uh, the term repo positions at the same time. So uh, what I want to do in the rest of my discussion is drill down a little bit into what types of primary dealers are actually accounting for uh, these uh, changes in positions and these changes in uh, repo financing. And in particular, I'm going to use the underlying data from the Effort 2004 report, which actually gives me all of this information uh, at the dealer level. And I'm going to group dealers into five categories. So first I'm going to identify uh, dealers that have U.S. banks. For those that have a U.S. bank that is subject to the supplementary leverage ratio, I'm going to group them into tercels uh, based on their uh, supplementary leverage ratio as of Q4 2019, so right, so the latest quarter before the start of the crisis, um, where uh, the bottom torso is going to be low reported SLR. So think of this as being the most constrained. Um, then I'm going to have some dealers that do have a US bank, but are not, but the US bank is not subject to SLR. And finally, I'm going to have a fifth category of primary dealers that don't actually have a US bank at all. And uh, corresponding to what I just showed you with the, the flows being concentrated in the longer maturity coupon bonds, um, I'm going to think about uh, changes in positions for long versus short, uh, where for these purposes, I'm going to define long as being uh, six years or more. Um, and then I also want to look at what happens in overnight versus the term securities uh, financing. And as I go through these results, what I want you to keep in the back of your mind is that the basic hypothesis we're thinking about is uh, March treasury dislocations happen because the uh, because constrained dealers had to absorb uh, this net customer flow um, or uh, customer supply shock. So let's start with uh, the um, with the positions data. Um, again, above the zero line, I have the long positions. Below the zero line, I have the short positions. Um, and each line in the graph corresponds to 
again, a different group of viewers. Uh, so the bright blue, which you will see is on top in all these graphs are the dealers uh, whose bank holding companies fall in this bottom tercel of the supplementary leverage ratio, uh, then moving through the two shades of gray uh, as, as we go down in the supplementary leverage tercels. Finally, the pinkish color are the dealers that have a US bank but are not subject to the supplementary leverage ratio. And finally, the darker blue line are the dealers that don't have a, bank, a US bank. And so ignoring for uh, a minute the dealers that don't have a US bank, what we do see is this uh, nice ranking where as you go from uh, a dealer that is not subject to SLR to uh, dealers that kind of have a big SLR cushion and all the way up to dealers in the uh, bottom torso, you see bigger increases in these positions. Um, and in particular, those increases are again concentrated in these securities with a six year maturity or more. You may be wondering whether um, since those dealers are also starting at a higher level of position, whether they really had to absorb more. Uh, I can tell you that you can do this plot in terms of percentage changes relative to January 2020 positions um, and again you get the same ranking. Now, the, the other thing that's sort of interesting is that if we look at increases in, in long versus short positions, again, for long positions, uh, sorry, for positions in uh, coupons with more than six year maturity, we see increases in, uh, on both sides of the balance sheet, although again, the increases in long positions are bigger. So on net, uh, those dealers uh, absorb the more uh, longer term maturities. Um, interestingly, though, uh, for the maturities below six year, you actually see that you do see uh, a differential increase in short positions and coupons. So maybe there was a, a little bit of a portfolio rebalancing, again, especially for dealers most constrained by SLR happening and them trying to uh, rebalance their new long positions in the six year with uh, short, uh, short positions in the below uh, six year line. Uh, one thing to point out is that uh, dealers without a US bank holding company act like they're somewhere in the middle of this SLR range, which pot potentially suggests that uh, beyond um, straight uh, regulatory leverage considerations, uh, there were also risk management considerations playing a role. Uh, again, going back to what Ricardo said at the beginning about maybe these longer term uh, bonds just becoming more volatile uh, in recent periods. Um, so corresponding to uh, this increase in uh, positions in positions in long bonds by more constrained dealers, we also see uh, bigger increases in overnight uh, repo financing by those dealers. Um, and again, you, uh, ignoring this now US bank category, you do again get this very nice spread of um, for the bank, uh, excuse me, for the dealers that are not constrained by SLR, they, uh, their repo positions essentially don't change. As their bank becomes more SLR constrained, um, they corresponding to them having to absorb more um, and more treasuries, they wind up uh, financing more of those in overnight repo. Now, what's interesting is that in term repo, you actually get a little bit of the opposite picture. Um, so the uh, dealers uh, whose banks are most constrained by SLR seem to uh, be engaged in a lot more reverse repo activity during this period. Um, and so then there is a question as to whether this dichotomy between overnight and term repo tells us something about either uh, the actual constraints that are being faced by dealers or uh, what do dealers think about, um, uh, uh, about the dislocation. So you can imagine that if dealers expect dislocations to be short-lived, they're willing to finance those positions 
in uh, overnight repo, knowing that both the positions and the repo financing uh, can go away after a couple of days. Or perhaps um, they are also worried about implications for things like the liquidity coverage ratio, where the longer uh, is your financing maturity, uh, the more uh, liquid assets you have to put up against that. The last thing I want to point out is that um, so far I've shown you what dealers wind up absorbing. Now, of course, what dealers wind up absorbing is an equilibrium outcome between uh, what gets sold to them uh, and what they're actually willing to hold. So a way of trying to understand how much of, um, uh, how much of the differential behavior by more constrained banks is coming from their customers versus what they do is to actually look at intermediate volume again at the dealer level or the dealer category level. So intermediate volume is uh, here I'm going to define as the ratio between transactions with others. So think non-dealers uh, and transactions with inter-dealer broker. Um, and the basic idea between uh, intermediated volume measures is that when you have low intermediate volume, you need to have more interdealer transactions to uh, find the ultimate customer uh, for, or to find the ultimate holder for the securities that enter into the system. Now, what you can see here is that um, unlike the previous uh, two sets of charts that I showed you, there are similar decreases in intermediate volume across the dealer categories. Um, and so what that tells you is that all dealers found client volume problematic to absorb. So it's not like a more constrained dealer could have found a less constrained dealer to uh, actually um, pass, through, uh, pass through those securities. And instead they wound up having to absorb those securities themselves, uh, which uh, is, in the world of the model, uh, and again, like in the world of um, limits to arbitrage, you think leads to bigger dislocations between markets. Um, Nina, would you like to like kind of wrap up? Yes, I will skip there. Um, so um, just to summarize what I've shown you, uh, so again, micro um, efforts held in four data is going to be consistent with the basic hypothesis of uh, large volumes of customer flows being absorbed by most constrained dealers. Now, one thing that is a little bit puzzling about this particular episode is that if you look at other markets, such as the corporate bond market, you don't see the same um, positions dynamics by more constrained dealers playing out in those markets. So, the, so beyond the supplementary leverage ratio, which is applicable to both treasuries and corporate bonds, there is something about the treasury market in particular that played out different in March. Um, and I think it would be interesting for the paper to actually think about that. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Nina. And I'll, before I let uh, Stefan answer, um, I wanted to uh, tell all the audience, uh, please raise your hands uh, in, the, uh, in the raise hand feature uh, if you want to participate in the discussion. Otherwise, we'll, uh, I mean, after the questions, we're going to go to uh, the Wonder platform. Stefan, please. Uh, yeah, so let me just thank Nina for a fantastic discussion. This is very interesting. And uh, I and uh, I, I also agree with the conclusion at the end that it would be nice to study this jointly with the corporate bond market and other assets to see, you know, sort of get an overall picture of what was going on. Uh, we are focusing right now on treasuries only, but I think the end goal should be to get a broad understanding of all of how, how all these pieces fit together. So, thank you. Uh, okay, so there's a number of questions. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to get to all of them. So let me ask the first question from Martin Schneider. Martin, do you want to ask? Uh, from Stanford. Do you want to uh, ask your question? Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, Stefan, yeah, I'm very sympathetic to the story and the, the, all these, these, uh, these quantity implications are, are very cool. But I was thinking kind of the, the other thing that happened in March was that people were still learning about whether the recovery would be V-shaped. So the question would be, 
is there a survey, are there survey forecasts of normal growth that just through a simple expectation hypothesis channel might lead to this type of things? Uh, so, that yeah, so, so we, we haven't looked at this specifically yet, but let me just say, and this, what I'm saying now also actually applies to another question that Anindo Sakar asked about whether a change in the covariance between inflation and output could play a role here. Um, I think all of these stories would not say anything about the inconvenience yield, you know, the treasury OS spread, right? This would, the, the story you have in mind would mean that the treasury curve should shift and the OS curve should shift, but there's no reason why there should be a big widening gap between the two. And so that's why I'm skeptical um, that, you know, this is the story. Uh, okay, the next uh, question is from Sebastian Amponte from Fed Board. Sebastian, please go ahead. Hi, um, very, very interesting paper and very interesting discussion. I um, mean, I guess uh, in reference to uh, Nina's final question, what was the difference between the corporate bond market? One thing comes to mind is the, the heavy reliance of of repo and reverse repo in the treasury market relative to the corporate bond market. I don't know if that's if that's something that, that we could think about, sort of how actual important the funding markets are and, and what contracts are used. That is, that is a possibility. This is one of the differences. Um, so it could be, but I'm, I'm you know, at this point, not, not sure um, whether this is the key difference or there's something else. Uh, okay, so the next question is again from Pierre Olivier Wall from uh, UCLA. Pierre Olivier, please. Um, hi everyone, uh, great uh, paper and discussion again. Uh, I wanted to just uh, follow up on Nina's uh, observation about the heterogeneous mm -hmm. uh, response. And if you had any thought about the type of underlying heterogeneity that could explain that, I mean, I guess the first thing that comes to mind would be heterogeneity and risk aversion, but- you know, Right, right, and this is actually an important point. So as Nina was you know, showing these charts, I was thinking about these, these patterns and it's, it's very interesting but it's, it's not easy to figure out exactly what it means because there must be a reason why dealers are initially different, right? Why some initially already some dealers are close to the constraint, others are not. Why some are big, some are not in treasuries and so on. And so I think you're right. One would need a model that builds in uh, you know, relevant sources of heterogeneity, risk aversion and other things to see whether one could you know, match that that cross sectional uh, dispersion that one sees there in these in these charts, um, but it's 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 not it's not very straightforward. So I I, I don't want to speculate on this. Um, this one. Thank you. Okay, great. So for the last question, uh, let's ask Andy Atkinson. Uh, he had a question. Andy, please go ahead. So thank you. I mean, uh, I think about the history of previous crises. You know, you go back to the 19th century when Europe, or early 20th, when Europe would have a war, they'd pull money out of the US. And given that in this case, COVID hit Asia first, would the dynamics be different than 2008 that you would have a reason people wanted to sell treasuries that they wanted uh, basic in Asia to pull back? Is there any evidence that those types of sales occurred? Yeah, so, so at least the data we have seen so far, it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, drill down at this level of detail to see whether this is going on. So for example, there's a huge sale of, you know, uh, uh, foreign investors from the Caribbean, but we have no idea what's behind Caribbean. These are obviously, this could be, you know, Asian investors, this could be, could be hedge funds, this could be someone else. So it's, it's difficult to tease out uh, who exactly it was who was selling there. So I think this is a big question on the table and uh, it, it's, it's possible. I mean, maybe in Asia, you know, they, they desperately wanted dollars and dollars, dollar cash, not in, not in, in the form of treasury bonds. And uh, the only way to get that cash buffer at the time was to sell the treasuries. Uh, and maybe the swap lines eventually helped to, you know, alleviate this, but um, it's a possibility, but we, 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 we couldn't find any, any, any good data on this yet. 